So, Gene and I have actually never, uh, yeah, for him, please. Unless he wants to lean over and talk in my shirt. <laughs> um, it would look kind of funny. It would look kind of funny. We probably shouldn't do that. Um, so all these years we've been, we have been working side by side together. And then, you know, we have different companies now for the last 10 years. But um, we are in the same building. And so he's upstairs. I'm downstairs. We actually in the same building that we've been in since 84. Uh, 84. Yeah. So they, far, they started their, their first DME uh, the year I was born and have been in that building ever since. So we're downstairs, they're upstairs. So a lot of different companies have been through there. A lot of, uh, of fun experiences and, and met a lot of people there. So it's kind of cool that we still get to work side by side, but we've never done a presentation together. And so uh, I thought he was gonna write the presentation. He thought I was gonna write it. And so uh, we just kind of- So just, here we are. <laughs> No, but really, we thought we would have uh, kind of a conversation because we, we've got a lot of interesting things that, that both of us are doing, and they're all centered around respiratory therapists. And so we thought it'd be interesting to think about or talk about how do respiratory therapists play into some of these new models that are very unique um, and that we believe are, are the future of where healthcare is going. And so first, though, I want to take you into history a little bit. And uh, we're probably going to tell some stories because yeah, I, I don't know if you guys, if you never hung out with either one of us, but... Uh, he's a storyteller, and I'm his son, so I'm a storyteller too. Yeah. But uh, anyway, so let's uh, uh, go through the museum. This is our museum in, in Livingston. So we have a, a respiratory museum. If you drive through Livingston, Tennessee, which if you've never been to Livingston, um, if you watch a Hallmark movie at Christmas time and they have all the lots and it's like cool little towns, that's Livingston, right? So uh, just watch a Hallmark movie, you've seen Livingston. The only difference is we have an iron lung and a respiratory museum um, right there on the square in Livingston and they all work um, and so we've got some pretty cool things you want to talk about these yeah so this this uh, of course sort of also shows my age obviously I'm a little older than he is a couple years a couple years and so uh, I, I said in Marvel almost every day at how far we have come from from my beginning um, if you look back, where, if I look back when I started in the late 70s or mid 70s, um, I see now, you know, ventilators that are six pounds when the ventilator that we used at home first was 48 pounds and would ventilate a horse really good. Uh, had a nice piston, you know, and all that. Uh, but it didn't have anything fancy on it, nothing, nothing super fancy at all. Uh, but just to think of how far we've come, just in my lifetime, I think about how far we're gonna come. If you're a new student, or if you're just getting in the field, or if you're young in the field, where is it gonna be? You think about where is it gonna be in 10 or 20 years from now? Uh, the uh, first, one of the, everybody laughs and they said, what is that? Uh, has anybody used a bird? All right, see, everybody knows a bird. All right, exactly. So it, it, at, the, uh, uh, at St. Thomas Hospital in Nashville, when we used to run out of, of vents in the, in the flu season, uh, we would always reach for a bird and we would start ventilating patients with a bird. And a lot of the younger docs would come in and say, what the hell is that? And you know, <laughs> we'd say, oh, it's a bird. You should know about this, you know. And they get big out about it. Um, and I don't know, do y'all know the story of how a bird came to be? What, what its predecessor, what the, the, the reason for the ceramic switch and the magnet was originally. Do anybody know that? Well, Dr. Forrest Bird was an aerospace engineer and he was trying to design a, a suit that would pressurize when pilots were, were hitting G-force. Because when they hit G-force, the blood would you know, move from their head and they'd pass out. And we didn't want our pilots passing out, obviously. So he came up with this ceramic switch kind of device, uh, first for a suit, and then he thought, hey, I could make a ventilator out of that. So there it is. Um, and it's a staple. I don't know if you had to do it in school or not, but we had to take it apart, make it work again, do all those things. Um, if you want to say anything, I'll let you, son. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> don't worry. I'll get plenty of time to talk. <laughs> So the, the young lady in the picture here came to visit us from Charleston, South Carolina. Um, she happened to be nearby, so she whipped up to Livingston and uh, she wanted to get in the iron lung. 
to get in the iron lung costs you five dollars to go for a ride, but it costs five hundred to get you out. But we usually don't tell you that until after you get in. <laughs> we don't tell you that until after you get in. Uh, but she had an interesting ride in there. We have one of about 30 in the whole world that still work. Um, and it is very functional. You can come, you can get in it, you can experience it. And it is, if you've never done it, it's a totally different experience. Um, you can't talk. When it decides you're going to breathe in, you're going to breathe in. And there's no stopping it. Uh, so that was, that was a lot of fun. What did that cost you? Which one? Okay, he the, stole some of them. Yeah, we stole them. <laughs> I didn't know he was going to ask that kind of Is stuff. Is this recorded? Uh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> what he means is borrowed. Borrow. Yeah, we borrowed it. We never took it back. The Iron Lung came off a movie set in Chicago, and it cost us $200 on eBay, and it cost 2500 to ship it to Livingston uh, because it weighs 900 pounds. When, when did you get it? When? when did, yeah, when? Oh, gosh, we've had that for six, seven years. More or longer, yeah. Ten years, baby. We've got two more now. We um, got. What movie is that? I don't know. I don't know. My brother bought it, and uh, you know, he just said it came off a movie set, and I believed him. So. Uh. It was probably one of those <laughs> drunk eBay purchases, you know. He, but, does, uh, he does drunk shop a lot. Yeah. So we have two more now um, that we got in Kentucky. Somebody called and said, "Hey, you want these iron lungs?" And so. We went and picked them up. They're they're pretty outdated, so they're rusted. We we're thinking about making smokers out of them, or maybe a maybe either, a either coffee table or, or coffee something table. like a coffee table would be kind of cool. Uh, we've always thought, well, it'd be a nice way to get buried. So now we've got plenty to get all of us to get buried in. Yeah, we won't all be stacked into one, you know, because that's yeah, that'd be weird. Bad. Yeah. Uh, oh, this, sorry. This, back here, that's this is uh, our our latest adventure. We're after this little baby. Uh, literally the baby inside of there and the baby iron lung. Um, I personally, I've seen iron lungs a lot in my lifetime, my career, but I never ever saw one of these. Uh, so we're hoping to be able to get that. It's an Emerson iron lung for, for babies. Um, it's in a, uh, has been in a medical museum and that museum is closing. Uh, so we have this one and yet another adult lung. If anybody needs one to be buried in, Give us a call because we're up to four now. Um, he didn't get the other ones. He didn't get the other pictures in there. Oh, okay. The, the other picture, uh, I don't think we got in there, but uh, there was two other pictures that, that y'all probably have never seen. But in the polio times, we ran out of iron lungs. And so in order to tr continue to treat the children, they had to think on their feet and, and think out of the box, if you will, and, and think what are the borders here that we have to work with, what can we do? Um, and so we have a picture of, uh, of a wall um, about the size of this screen, and there are four heads sticking out of that wall. And those four heads are four children, so they, they depressurized an entire room on the other side. So all four of those children were breathing at the exact same rate and at the exact volume that that iron lung device was set at. What's really interesting to me is if you look at this picture is that outside uh, by each one of these children's heads it is a doll and they can see that doll but they can't touch it. Inside is a nurse working with the inside, uh, on their inside needs I guess you would call that, um, inside the chamber, inside needs. Uh, but they've taken care of their bodily needs. And there is the same doll hanging inside of there. So the child could reach up and touch that doll and they could see it out here so they could imagine that they were playing with their doll. Uh, the big question we always ask and students come and we ask different people this question, that nurse inside, was she breathing at the same rate as those children were? And the answer is no, because she was inside the chamber so she would breathe normally. But what did happen to all those nurses is they all went deaf because of minus 40 centimeters of water popped their eardrums and caused them to go deaf. So that's all I got anyway, to say. Fun, fun historical facts. Uh, so if you're ever in Livingston, come by and see the museum. You can take a ride. You already know our tricks, so we'll, we'll give you a discount to get out. Um, but anyway, so we're going to talk about post-acute care, and the title is Post-Acute Care Without Borders. And so... I um, want to talk a little bit about what that means to us, and I will, I'll let you talk again and start us off, and then I'll go from there. 
All right. Uh, so we've been in the post-acute care arena since, I guess, 1984, uh, maybe a little bit before that. Um, we started off with a small DME company and grew it to a very large DME company, uh, and then it was acquired by a national company, and they took it. Um, we, in the early days, it was extremely crude. If any of y'all have been in the DME world for a long time, you'll know that the concentrators at the time were as big as a, a wash tub or as big as a, a boat, I guess. Um, and they were, they were very cumbersome and hard to deal with. Uh, we've seen that technology change, and the post-acute arena, to me, is very important. And, and we've had to adjust as where do we offer our services? Is it just in the home, or is it in nursing homes as well? Uh, and then what happens if we have a crisis? Where else could we do it? Well, our answer has always been we could do it in a tent if we had to, if we had the equipment to do it. And ironically, we are about at the point where we now have the technology, and during COVID, we did do it in a tent a lot, if you remember. Uh, so post-acute care um, and without borders is exactly the mindset that we've always had uh, to do whatever we have to do outside the walls of a hospital. Uh, and outside the box, I think, is the important And outside part. the box. Yeah. And, you know, he's, he's always been this brilliant respiratory therapist. And so when I was, I tell this story that when I was growing up, um, I knew him and my uncle, and they were always my heroes. And so I didn't have, like, superhero heroes. It was those guys. So when I went to respiratory school, I thought it was, like, nurses, doctors, astronauts, respiratory therapists. And uh, <laughs> so... Uh, that's what I thought, because they could just change the world. You know, they had ideas, and they'd figure it out, and they'd go talk to the governor or do whatever. Um, and so I thought respiratory therapists were just superheroes. I went to respiratory school. I did my first day of clinicals. I'm like, who are all you people? You know, like, where, where's all the superheroes at? Uh, uh, so I, I had kind of a rude awakening when I got to the – I'm not saying they weren't, but I'm just saying when you got there, it's like – this is not what I imagined. You know, it's, it's people, a lot of people were negative. A lot of people were, were, were apathetic. And so you walk into a department, and it's like, wow, um, how, how is it like this and why? And you know what happens is, what's interesting, you laugh about it. You, you laugh about it, and, and I wasn't saying anybody in this room. Obviously, none of you were there. But, but we've all experienced it, right? I'm, I'm not talking out of line that we've all experienced it, especially lately. And so it's so easy to get in that place. And I even got in that place. And so I have to often remind myself why I do what I do and the reasons that I became a respiratory therapist and the reasons that I love this profession so much and that it's, it, it has to be about patients and not just about me. Um, but anyway, so the, going back to the DME story, you know, he's always been this brilliant respiratory therapist. His business plan for the first DME, uh, they were going to make $2,500 a year in beer money. Right? Beer money, yes. Yeah. Sure. yeah, we got it framed in the office. You know, he convinced his brother to move from Charlotte, North Carolina, down to Livingston, Tennessee, because they were going to split $2,500 a year in beer money in 1984. And, um, and he would get his, his $12,000 a year salary. Oh, yeah. Well, there's that. Yeah. And so... Uh, Anyway, so the, the idea that post-acute care without borders has always been, for me, just kind of growing up, watching them go into to challenges, seeing challenges, and not seeing them as roadblocks, but seeing them as opportunities. And so over the years, when, when there wasn't a reimbursement, or there wasn't a rule in place, or there wasn't a way to get paid for uh, ventilator programs and nursing homes, um, they never saw that as a roadblock. They saw it as an opportunity and figured out a way to create a new model, a new reimbursement, a new guideline, whatever it took to be able to, to overcome that challenge. And so for me, I just kind of came by it naturally, this idea that there is no box and you don't have to live in a box. And just because somebody says there's this rule or regulation or we can't do things this way, doesn't mean that it has to be that way. It just means that it takes some work to change. And so this idea that uh, just because we don't get paid for respiratory therapy today or that DME is the only way we have RTs in the home or in the nursing home, you know, we're piggybacking off of rehab services and we get paid a little bit, uh, doesn't mean that we have to fit in that box just because somebody defined it for us. And so in this current healthcare environment that we're in, where now everything's about value, it creates the biggest opportunity that we've ever seen as respiratory therapists. And what I mean by that is that now it doesn't matter if there's a reimbursement for what you do because there is a value-based model that we can create that now you can get paid for what we do based on how much we can save, 
how much value we can create, how much we can improve patient care. And so there's all these different opportunities for us that we have to start to recognize and be MacGyvers, as I said before, and start to go after those models and figure out ways to kind of pioneer the future. Because uh, if you think about that history that we just looked at, you know, that was old technology that we look at now, we think it's crazy that we used to use that kind of technology. Um, I think in 20 years from now, we'll look back as a profession and we'll think it's crazy the way that we used to do business and the way that we used to get paid and the way that we used to practice because we will pioneer the future model of what does it look like? How do we get paid? How do we start to bring value to our, our partners and to the physicians and to the hospitals? Um, and, and how do we make it about not just um, the, the mission because we're all mission driven? How many people got into respiratory for the money? I only know one person. Yeah, oh, th there's one. All the years I've asked that, it's only been two people that got into respiratory for the money. Uh, or, or there's a bunch of liars. I don't know which one. But uh, <laughs> anyway, so, so um, but most of us got into it because we want to make a difference, right? We wanted uh, to change the world. We wanted to help people. We had a sick family member, uh, whatever the reason. And so most of us are mission-minded, but we have to be margin-minded too because healthcare is a business. And so if you work in DME, in a hospital, in a skilled nursing facility, if they don't make money, then they can't take care of patients. And oftentimes we don't like to think about that dirty side of, of it's all about the money, but it has to be about the money because if you don't make money, you can't continue to operate. Um, but in this new state that we're in, this new healthcare environment, um, we have this opportunity that now you can make it about the money, the mission, uh, and the margin at the same time, right? Because we can improve outcomes, improve value, improve health care for our patients, take better care of patients, and save money at the same time, which puts money back in our, our uh, organization's pocket. That's, what, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. Uh, uh, well, I think we kind of answered said, that one. We, we, really, we really even never had a box. Uh, that was a different a difference in what we did, and we always went after what is the, what is the thing we can do that will work and we can still eat. Um, my brother always hates for me to say it, but I've said it many times, is we would do this for free if we could figure out a way to buy shoes and eat. Um, but he hates it when I say that. He used to call the, the 30 free ventilator patients that we had, that was his Porsche payment, the Porsche he didn't have. <laughs> <laughs> we, we did end up taking care of a lot of patients for freeze because, again, that's what we do. Um, he didn't like it. The status of our healthcare system right now is, is a mess, I think. Uh, we still are stuck in the mindset of fee-for-service payments, even though we're moving toward value-based payments. Everybody is always thinking, I can't get paid for this, this X I did, or I can't get paid for this piece of equipment I did, or I can't get paid for whatever on a fee-for-service basis. Um, and again, when we talk about DMEs doing clinical services, uh, I would love for those clinical services to be paid for, but one of the big things that the payers fear uh, is that okay? I've I've got uh, I've got more in this than I should have. If I do clinical services, and then I call you and say, hey, we need to add on two new devices to what this patient's getting at home, and it'll really help them. And the question comes up: Do they really need that? And is it really going to help them, or did I just do that to increase my sale and upcharge and make more on the bottom line? Uh, so there's a lot of distrust out there. Um, the fact that we've had that always a fee-for-service system and now we're changing to value-based, it just really, it doesn't fit in a lot of people's minds. As Zach says, there are ways to get paid, you just don't pay by the treatment or by the, the procedure or whatever. We get paid because of the fact that we decrease the amount of money spent on taking care of the patients. Uh, in the value-based program we have in Tennessee, that is the first in the nation for long-term ventilator patients in skilled nursing facilities. I uh, got the data yesterday, actually, uh, that since its inception in 2015, when it was first rolled out, we've decreased the state's expenditure by 20% a year every year since then. The, the total that we have saved the state is massive. Uh, the very first year that we rolled it out, the savings were $25 million to the state. Uh, so if we're hitting those kind of numbers and the state sees what we're doing, again, you back that up against people saying, uh, we don't get any respect. Well, you know what? In Tennessee, you're a respiratory therapist. You do get respect. They do respect what we're doing. 
uh, and not just because it's me, but anytime they hear respiratory therapists, they are like, "This is y'all are great guys. You know, you do a good job." That's what they expect. Uh, when COVID came along, the, they they asked us. The very first thing was, "Can you design a a COVID facility?" So, what would a nursing home look like that only took COVID patients? And so we designed that, and they also asked us to oversee that during the the COVID uh, crisis, uh, which we did. We also designed a ventilator unit, uh, but thank goodness we never hit that mark that we had a lot of vent patients coming out of the hospital that still uh, need to be ventilated. Uh, so our healthcare system needs a, a lot of retweaking. Re re um, it does need to be brought up to speed so the respiratory therapists are at least included in the languages uh, at, at CMS. Um, and, and I think it's time to do that. I think there's some real, as we, we keep preaching, there are real opportunities right now, guys. It's the best time of our careers to make change. Yeah, and the, the thought process that we've always done things a certain way, so that's the way we should do them, has to go. You know, just because breathing treatments have been a big part of our, our operation inside of the, the hospital, uh, how much value do we bring to patients given breathing treatments all day? Not much, right? We should be doing things that help us operate at the top of our license, whether it's in the hospital or in the home. How do we bring value and not just do procedures? Because procedures drive productivity in the old model. In the future model, it's got to be about outcomes, how we improve care, how do we operate at the top of our license, how do we be the, the astronauts that we all can be, right? And, and get to a place where we're not burnt out because we're just doing treatments all day or just doing the same thing over and over, but we can really take care of people the way that we wanted to and, and we go to school and we get all excited about it and then we get out and it's like, I'm not doing half the things that I learned and, and I'm stuck in this environment where I'm not able to. So now we have this opportunity, no matter where you're at, to start to create because right now, healthcare is changing faster than it ever has. Um, from a standpoint of what we do in healthcare, the way it's paid for, the way that new models are coming about, the way that, that everything is happening in the last 10 years, healthcare has changed faster than ever. And it's all driven by value-based models, outcome-based models, and the ability to start getting paid for better care or saving money. I mean, if you look at, uh, again, Aetna is one of the, the plans that 75% of all the dollars they spend are based on our value-based dollars. Um, and from that, they've saved $4 billion in healthcare dollars. So, you know, Obamacare came out, a lot of people didn't like it, doesn't matter what your politics are, it, it changed healthcare. And that was the starting point. That and some of the things that CMS Innovations did were the starting points that, that really start, started this ball rolling uh, that have created this opportunity for us, but also have created challenges for us because we now have to figure out ways to, to show our value in a whole different way. Um, so the opportunity is there, but there's also an opportunity that, that that will pass us by and we'll miss the train altogether if we don't start to, to thrive in this new environment. Okay. I think we already kind of answered that. Yeah, we kind of did these. Uh, <laughs> Uh, okay, so let's talk about a little bit. We touched on this the last talk, but um, talk a little bit about, um, we were telling these stories last night, all, all the cool things that we've done with some ventilator patients, getting them off the vent over the years, and we never got paid for it. And so um, one of the things that we were talking about is we were trained by Dr. John Bach. Anybody know who John Bach is? Um, Anybody ever met John Bach? No. So John Bach... Um, yeah. We should. So I had him come speak at a conference one time, and uh, he, uh, he's a physician neurologist up in New Jersey. He's got ventilator patients that, that fly to see him from all over the world. Um, he does not believe in trachs. So he does not trach almost anybody, um, unless you have ALS or bulbar involvement. He doesn't trach anybody. And so we started working with him and, and realized, and this is really how I got into the non-invasive space, was, was working with him. But the first time he came to a conference to speak, he, uh, he drove down, he bought a, what was it, $3,500 Corolla. It was $2,500. $2,500. Still had the, the riding on the back window, $2,500. He bought it from a little used car lot, and he drove his family of five down in this 1996 Corolla. And so he comes to Nashville, he rolls up at the conference, and uh, walks in with his blue jean jacket, kind of dirty, and uh, his jacket was kind of dirty. And so he's, he's sitting there, I walk in, he's talking to all these respiratory students. They thought he was a homeless guy that walked in off the street. And I said, oh, this is our keynote speaker. And they're like, what, what? 
And he says, he says, Zach, he said, I burned this Shakira CD for you. And he pulls a CD out that he burned for me and gives me a Shakira CD. And I was so confused. I, I didn't know how he knew I liked Shakira. But somehow he knew. And he gave you like a blues CD. Yeah, it's blues. I, we got them for years. We got them for years. He would just send them to us. Like more Shakira, more blues. I'm like, yeah. oh, what is that? Anyway, so he's an interesting, interesting physician. But the cool thing about him is that he had this, this vision and he's executed on it in his own practice that we don't have to do things the way we've always done them. And his point is that trachs, for an example, are really driven by reimbursement. The only reason we do so many trachs in the hospital is because at the point you do a trach, the hospital gets paid a lot more money and the physicians get paid more. And because healthcare is a business, um, that has been a driving factor in why we trach people earlier. Now, infections are less if you trach people earlier. We know some of those things, but, but it's a driving factor in why so many people get trach. Um, and if you look at the, his, his success and his programs, his neuromuscular patients uh, live so much longer because they don't have infections. They don't have all the issues. Um, so anyway, so he came in and he trained us and he, he went to our vent unit. We were walking around and he was, you had to like slap his hands because every trach patient he walked by, he was trying to pull that bad boy out. <laughs> Get off, you can't do that yet. Uh, and so he'd go see patients that had been on a trach for 20 years and he'd want to pull them out, you know, and, and he was doing that successfully. So he taught us how to do his method and we thought we were really good at it. Oh yeah, we, yeah. we, we were top notch at it, we thought. So, um, and, to, and, and so, Zach, of course, he went through this training, and uh, we spent two days with Dr. Bach, uh, and he talked for two days nonstop. It was eight hours a day, and I've got it on tape, and you can't even watch it because it's so long, you know. But he would tell of his experience with, with the queen of whatever and the king of Spain decannulating their family members and all that. Like Zach said, he travels the, the whole world. He has about 300 published articles. He's easy to look up. He is the guru of non-invasive ventilation. Every meeting I've ever been to in Barcelona or in Portugal or anywhere abroad, Dr. Bach is always one of the speakers there. He's highly controversial. Um, he is a zealot about taking out trachs. Uh, as Zach said, we had a patient there that in one of these units that had been tracheostomized for 16 years, quadriplegic, um, talked with a, a, a valve uh, and had a sip and puff chair. He saw her in the hall and he said, hey, how would you like to get your trach out? And she said, oh, I'd love that. And he said, okay. And he pulled it. <laughs> like, I said, dang, give, me, give us a minute to get some stuff ready. Yo. I said, well, she can't breathe. He said, oh, she'll learn real quick. Now start. <laughs> he said, now start frog breathing. And yep. she did, you know, so. It lasted about five minutes. We decided we'd go ahead and put it back in, whether he wanted to or not. We we took him to the other end of the hall and stuck the drake back in there. Um, but but the uh, um, but what came from that was we we recognized that the way we'd always done things didn't have to be the way we did it going forward, um, and we became cowboys after that. We uh, Absolutely. local hospital called us about a patient. We we told this story to Dr. McIntyre and Dr. Lennon last night. A local hospital called us about a patient. And they said, we can't get this patient off the vent, been intubated 22 days. Um, they extubated him two or three times, failed every time, neuromuscular, Duchesne's patient. He wouldn't go to Nashville because his family couldn't drive on the interstate. So they refused transport to Nashville. Um, he had just got married and he had married a German girl that he met online playing poker. And- um, He won her. <laughs> <laughs> So she moved here to Salina, Tennessee, and um, she moved up here to marry him and, and to take care of him. So he didn't want to trade because they were going to have kids and they just got married. You know, that wasn't, that wasn't sexy. And so, uh, so they called us, the hospital called us and said, we don't know what to do. We know you guys are doing some, some non-invasive stuff. And so they asked us to come over. So we both got privileges at the hospital. And uh, we went in there like a couple cowboys. And uh, uh, we said, we can get this guy off the vent. We'll extubate him, put him on non-invasive. We'll get him home. He already failed twice in the last week. They extubated him, had to re-intubate him. Failed all the weaning trials by far. You know, he was not a candidate for extubation in traditional healthcare. Um, so we called Dr. Bach. He told us what to do. And we walked in and we had the CEO of the hospital, the CFO, chief nursing officer, every doc that had privileges there. They were all standing around us in the ICU looking at what these crazy guys were about to do. About 25 people in the room yeah. watching, not helping, just watching. Yeah. And so we, uh, we started doing cough assist on them really aggressively, and then we extubate them. 
And so here I am. I was a pretty young respiratory therapist at the time. And I remember uh, he started crashing. And I looked over at Dad, and I could see the oh crap eyes that he had. <laughs> and I thought, oh, we're screwed. <laughs> this is not going to go good at all. Um, so anyway, we got the guy stabilized, and he got off the vent. Now, if he would have went to Nashville, or if he would have got a trach, he would have never came off that trach. That kid spent the next 10 years off the ventilator on non-invasive ventilation at night only. He went to Germany with his wife. He got to go to, we took him to some UFC fights. Um, and so he got off the vent, and the point that we were making last night is all these cases we've done, we didn't get paid a dollar for it. And the, the worst part about that one was we said, well, we did it. And so we, we were ready to head out. And they said, you can't leave. <laughs> it's your well, patient. You know, well, you mean we can't leave. This is your hospital. Oh, you guys got to stay. So the next 72 hours, we took shifts staying at the hospital, staying with this guy so we can get him home. But we took him home a week later and, uh, and actually got completely off the vent for about five years. And then he was on non-invasive ventilation at night. So we gave this kid 10 years back of his life by doing things differently, thinking outside the box. And that kind of taught us going through some of those things that um, we don't have to do things the way we've always done them. And that's really what started my, the process when I went to Alana Healthcare in Nashville and, and had this thought that if we don't have to trach non-invasive patients, why would we ever trach a COPD patient? I mean, it just doesn't make sense. No COPD patient should ever be trached. And so uh, we had this thought, and so we started non-invasive ventilation program, and it blew up across the country, and we put, put out 5,000 ventilators across the United States, doing non-invasive, being preventative, trying to get people on non-invasive ventilation much earlier in the process so that we could keep them from getting to the point that they got trach, because it doesn't make any sense that we would ever trach a COPD patient. Um, and we don't see that many of them trached anymore, uh, but back then we, we saw quite a few. So anyway, yeah, and the, calling it the money, the, the driver of why so many tricks happen is exactly right. It's about the money, and you can take a really clear look at what happened when the, when ventilator-associated pneumonia was being paid for extra by Medicare. Everybody got ventilator-associated pneumonia. Not that we gave it to them; we just didn't care if they got it. Basically, uh, it wasn't a conspiracy, but oh, it's like oh, well, everybody gets that, so they they write another check. Well, at one point, they finally said, you know what, we're not going to pay for that anymore. If they get pneumonia, it's your fault. It's your problem. The minute they stopped paying for that, guess what happened? Uh, the ventilator-associated pneumonia rate went zoop, almost down to nothing. And it was all, and I swear I believe this till the day I die, it was all about the money. If tomorrow Medicare said, if that patient has to have a trach, then it's on you. You didn't do a good job weaning them. I guarantee you the trachs will dry up in a heartbeat, and unfortunately, we might be out of business because there's not going to be any home ventilator patients left because they're going to wean every one of them, you know? So we, we have to think about what else is probably being done just because we get paid for it. So we have to think about that. We have to back off of those things. Uh, we developed a, a video, well, this is a little off subject, but we developed a video for um, Wake Forest Baptist Hospital and it was a talk on what's going to happen to mama after she gets her trach. And what had been happening was that hospital had one of the highest trach rates per, per patient day of anybody in the United States. So they told us they had this problem. We said, hey, why don't you quit letting these residents go in and everybody tell a different story about what's going to happen with mama. Let's do one video that says very very candidly, here is the problem and here is the risk. And watch everybody see that same video that's going to have to get a trach. They did that. They decreased their trachs by 40% the very first year just by showing a video and everybody hearing the same message. So, again, it can be done. It's not magic. Uh, so many times people have said to us, what's your magic for weaning patients off the ventilator that nobody else could? Well, it wasn't really magic. We took them to the shower. We got their hair done. We got their fingernails done if it was a female. Uh, we put a speaking valve in for the first time. They called their family. And the first thing they would always say to their family, I'll never forget, is I'm better. I'm getting better. And when they say that, we know that we're on the right path. Uh, the, the young man that Zach mentioned, Jason, uh, he did have 10 good years. <clears throat> 
He did have a, a pneumonia and did have respiratory failure again. Uh, this time uh, he was at a, in a major hospital in Tennessee. I won't say which one. Uh, but his family called and says, we need you to come down here and do that thing you do again. And I said, you know, I don't know that this hospital is going to let me come in and do this little thing I do. So we uh, called all the contacts we had there and talked to the docs, and they finally agreed to do it. They did it. I didn't do it. And we gave them the protocol. Here's the way it works. And they did it, and it was successful. And this young man, a couple of days later, was moved out of the unit up on the floor. Um, one night, he was found unresponsive. His CO2 was high. He was unconscious. His mask had slipped off. His non-invasive was off. Um, and so what they do, they intubated him, and they trached him. And so he did get a trach. So we said, okay, he's got a trach. Let's bring him up to one of these centers, one of these vent units, and let's, let's wean the trach and not the vent. Let's get that trach back out. Uh, and the, the docs there said, nope, we're going to send him home. There's nothing can be done for him. That's it. He's at the end. So we had the family force it, more or less, to insist that this, that this young man go to the center. Uh, he was there for two months. Uh, we were successful in getting his trach out back to non-invasive at, at, at night. Uh, he did go home. Uh, and about eight months ago, he got another pneumonia, and uh, he died before he got there. So we lost him. But anyway, probably, I'm going to guess, 15 years that he, that he would gained uh, because of that. So you got to think about, you know, what can we do that we can prevent those kind of things from happening? Yeah, and, and growing up, he always said it was the Wizard of Oz effect, that one day somebody was going to pull back the curtain and realize we didn't have anything special that we were doing. We were just providing really good respiratory care, you know. We were just doing respiratory care the way it should be done. And so when it comes to ventilator care, when it comes to COPD management, I mean, we're, we're not doing anything special. Um, there's no special sauce. We're just doing the right thing, you know. And, and that's the thing that uh, in historically, again, go back to this, is that if we're getting paid for an oxygen concentrator or a CPAP or a ventilator, then there's so much focus on that one piece. Or we're getting paid to deliver a procedure in the hospital and there's so much focus on that one piece. Uh, but we have to start thinking about the idea that it's, it's not just about, we don't have to be in that box anymore, right? We're in a different world. And so the box, the thing that we've been focused on, we have to go kind of beyond the box and start to think about what's the right way to manage a patient and how can we work the best way to manage a patient into the ways that we get paid? And so that's why I'm so excited about where we're at today because on the DME side, um, in skilled nursing facilities, all of a sudden in, in physician offices, all of a sudden you see these models that have emerged. And those models are driven by respiratory therapists, pulmonary navigators in the hospital, navigators or uh, respiratory therapists working in, in ambulatory care centers or primary care offices and able to drive revenue by doing the right thing. Or you see these models where DMEs are starting to really focus on outcomes and the RT has become the center of what they do. And so we, we see this evolution starting to happen and we see all this opportunity, but with the opportunity also is the challenge that there's not enough staff out there. There's not enough people to do it. And that's where we see technology really starting to evolve and the idea that, that technology will really be the way that we can enable respiratory care into these different environments and how can we be on the forefront of that and start to, as we talked about in the last talk, um, adapt to those changes and be able to uh, uh, take them as they come because just because it's the way we've always done it doesn't mean it's the right way. And the idea that I could deliver respiratory care from my living room to a patient anywhere in the world uh, or I could even manage a ventilator anywhere in the world. You know, it's the, these types of models are here. They're, we're just starting to scratch the surface on these models, but we're going to see uh, an evolution over the next couple of years because of technology that respiratory therapists will be at the forefront, but may not actually be at the patient's bedside delivering the care. And, and I encourage any of y'all, if you, if you do feel burnout, if you're in a position you've been in for years, you're stuck doing treatments, don't give up, just change where you are. Uh, look for some other opportunities that are out there, and I promise you they are out there, whether it be home care or the kind of work that we're doing with the, the skilled nursing facilities or outcomes management. 
or something like Zach's doing with, with telehealth and all of these different products are just there and we need people. So if you're burnt out, give us a call. <laughs> So, we have any questions? We got ten minutes left, right? Uh, do we have any any questions? Yes, I work at the LTAC in the upstate of South Carolina. We are. I live an hour from Georgia, an hour from North Carolina, and an hour from three major medical centers in South Carolina. We have a lot of problem recruiting new staff because of licensure, state license. What would you suggest? How would how would we go about getting contact? Who would who would be the driving force? Would that be the the problem with that is the driving force is going to be the respiratory care boards in each state that are going to have to start communicating and saying let's say two of them got together and say hey let's do a compact license. Well, in order to do that, they're going to have to make their licensure requirements almost exactly the same or similar enough to trust each other. Then you add on another state, another state, another state. And eventually, you could get it done. But from the nursing perspective, it took them about 20 years to get compact licensure approved. And they are a massive number of people. We are a small number of people. And across the United States, only about 25% of us as a group are members of the American Association of Respiratory Care, which means we are not members of our state association which means that we are stripped of all the power we ever thought we could have. Because four or five people going to say, hey, let's go to a compact licensure, we're only four or five representing several hundred. And so we have to get involved as a group in our state association and our national association, and then start working with the respiratory care boards in each individual state to try to get that compact do it done. It's not the NBRC's position, it's not the AERC's position, but the AERC can advocate for it once we get it started, and they will certainly help us get it done, but it's not the driving force that would have to happen. It has to be the respiratory care boards from the various states. Why would they not want to do that? It makes all the sense in the world to us to do it. Well, how much does your license cost every year? How many therapists are they? So they have that overriding factor as well is, you know, they, they, there's some money coming in for licensure. Um, and that's a bit of a problem in some states. In Tennessee, we're very lucky our licensure has, has our license fees have dropped over the years. Uh, and, you know, we, we have a very fair licensing system compared to what I see in a lot of other states. Uh, but, but it would have to come from the respiratory care boards. And Colleen, do you... You got a comment on that. Colleen's been very involved with the AERC and NBRC for as many years as I have. So, so when I was chair of the Western Care Board here in Tennessee, we were told we could not initiate legislation. The board does not have any lobbyists per se. So in the state of Tennessee, it would have to be initiated by the Tennessee Society for Respiratory Care. And because licensures in every state are so different as far as their requirements, it's even hard to have reciprocity. Meaning, and if you're not reciprocity, meaning if you meet the requirement in the next state, you don't have to go through all that crap to get your, to get your license, but our, our states don't even have that. So, I think it's a goal that we need to reach for, because even telemedicine, you can't if you're licensed in Tennessee, you cannot call a patient in Michigan or Florida to adjust their CPAP because you don't have a license in that state, and that sucks. Yes, it does. I mean, that really hurts. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, so that, that hurts our profession as much as it hurts what good we can do, and especially with the shortage of therapists we have right now. Wouldn't it be awesome to be able to help in other states as well? But we can't. So again, I think it's something we need to work 
boards. I think it's going to take 15, 20, 30 years. How we've been in the profession for 50, so you know, we just started it 50 years ago. We have us, so some of you new people, you need to start it because it's got to start somewhere. But it's got, in this state, it has to be with the state society, which has absolutely gone apart in our state because of COVID and well, it just has. So Gene said, you, you know, Zach said, you know, when I get restarted, I'm on board, and I am to help with that. But it's going to take more than three people across the state to do it. And, and we all live in the same Olympic County. So, the respiratory care board definitely has to be on board for it to pass, but they cannot lobby for it, and they cannot initiate. Sorry it took so long to answer that question. We went in circles, but that, it's, it's complicated. Yeah. Um, and, and there is, you know, there is a lot of expense in, in, to, to defend the state a little bit. There is a lot of expense to having a regulatory board uh, that's, that does, you know, investigate and prosecute things that, that do happen that are bad, that respiratory therapists might be involved with. Uh, so they, they do have to have funds for that. Any other questions? They have to get licensed. They have to get licensed. Oh. And during COVID, they had um, what, uh, the governor. Yeah, the, yeah, yeah. Was part of the PHE, they, they had a. Was it like an emergency? Oh, an executive order. Okay, an executive order. Yeah. Yeah. But those have. Most of those have uh, expired. Yeah. Okay. During, yeah. during COVID, we could go anywhere and work, and basically yeah. the whole world. And. Yeah. 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 No, but you do now. You have yes. to get a license yes. for every new Most every state. Yeah. Now, like New York, they extend that executive order yes. by month, so they just yeah. extend it one more month. Um, but likely they're all going to end at some point soon. Um, but even, like Colleen said, if you're doing telehealth, we can't do telehealth. We're managing patients all over the country, and we have to get licensed in every single state that we see patients in um, if they require respiratory therapists to have a license to do that service. So it's... Uh, do what? Depends on what service. So like for CPAP, it's 14 states. Ventilators, it's 48, 49. Um, we so still, it depends I think we on still have one state that doesn't have licensure, Alaska. Alaska. Yeah. Alaska. And I've read some interesting things about Alaska. The, the Alaskans claim that, that we're sending all the, uh, the bad therapists up there because they don't have a license. And we're like, we're not sending them anywhere. Yeah. <laughs> so I know we're, we're low on time here. The, the thing that... Um, you know, the, the one thing I want to say at the end here is since I started out sounding like a jerk, like I insulted everybody, I apologize. It didn't mean to come across that way if it did. But anyway, but I do think that uh, Mark's laughing at me. Uh, anyway, the, the point, though, is that the one thing that I picked up from my father over the years is that we have this deep passion about this profession and, and one that has been ingrained in me so much that uh, my, my employees all the time are fussing at me because I feel like I should hire a respiratory therapist for every position in our company. And if you look at our companies, 90% of our operations are ran by respiratory therapists. We have respiratory therapists in all kinds of leadership management positions that aren't even doing respiratory care anymore uh, because we're so passionate about this profession. And if you look at all the things like Colleen, uh, Gene, we have, we have committed our careers and lives to serving on the respiratory care boards, AARC, TSRC, um, to change this profession. And we gotta have more people. And I know there's some people in this room as I look around that have, have spent a lot of their years uh, advocating and, and volunteering. Uh, but we can't forget about those things because post COVID we're a different profession, we're different people. Most of us have changed in some form or fashion because the pandemic changed us. Uh, but we have to get back involved and we have to find ways to advocate now is the time because it's make it or break it right now. Um, the next few years will make the difference in how we evolve and how we advance our profession. And it's gonna take all of you getting involved, all of us getting involved and finding ways to, to make patients' lives better and to make our profession better. And so we have to do it together. Real quick, I just want to add a point. Community. Families and communities working together. Did you made a point? You're in the same county, and I believe that the patient input 
at the community level, working with the therapist, is what you guys have been listening to for years, and we need to build on it. Thank, Thank you all very much for putting up with our jibber-jabber. Yeah.